Okay, so we have motivated how it's um, you know it may be possible to represent a periodic function as you know, as a series of uh, as a sum of a bunch of sines and cosines, right? So, and specifically we looked at the example of the harmonics and overtones of a musical note, right? So that's the uh, the problem of Fourier series. But before we go there, we will we will uh, before we describe you know like a prescription for how to uh, get the Fourier series for a periodic function. Let's look at the idea the idea of the average of a function, right? Which is the subject of for this lecture. Okay, so so the average of a function is something that you know we can understand intuitively based on how we look at average of given a bunch of numbers we would just add them up and take the and divide them by the number of uh, you know, these numbers that you are working with and likewise if you are given a function on some interval right you just integrate uh, which is like a sum itself right which where you have, there is a limiting procedure that we are considering and then you divide by the length of the interval right so this is the the notion of the average of a function f of x on an interval. Now, you know the average of a function uh, appears in many contexts, right? So let's look at a few examples. So the average of sine of x over any number of periods is going to be zero, right? As long as you take a full period. If you take a, an average over half a period, then it's not going to be zero, right? So uh, the average value of the velocity of a simple harmonic oscillator over any number of vibrations is zero. Uh, because it's, it's really the idea of you know averaging over a sinusoidal function is going to give you zero. But many times, you know, more information may be contained in the average of the square of this function, right? So, uh, you know, if if a function is spending equal amount of time, you know, uh, above the x-axis as it spends, uh, or the time axis above the time axis as it spends below the time axis then you know although on average the function itself may be zero it's still uh, you know the uh, the square of this function may also contain information right so so many times it's useful to consider the average of the square of your function right for example when you're looking at alternating electric current right so we know that it's uh, it's a periodic function and uh, the the square root of the average of the sine squared it's known as the root mean square or effective value of the current, right? So if you just blindly do an average of this current function, you would just get zero, right? But clearly, uh, the the current being zero is not a, 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 an accurate way of representing what it's doing, right? So it definitely has, you know, the current has, um, um, you know, can do things for you, right? Which means that it, it it's not just a, a zero object. So here, a more useful quantity to you know to measure the current is in fact the root mean square or effective value of the current and which is what you would measure if you took an AC ammeter right so in the example of the simple harmonic uh, oscillator so the average kinetic energy is something that you might be interested in measuring right so that would be given by half m you know average of v squared right so when you're looking at the kinetic theory of gases you know you have lots of particles and there too you're interested in measuring the average of um, you know v squared is of great importance, right? So you might have seen these kind of, you know, concepts of you know, equipartition theorem in statistical mechanics. You know, these kinds of averages are you know, are of importance, right? Sometimes one is interested in the time average. Sometimes one is in, in, interested in some ensemble average, and so on. Right? So all kinds of uh, averages are of interest, right? So for for our discussion, we are looking at you know the properties of just a one-dimensional function, right? And so the average is taken on certain intervals here, right? So you can, you know, the, the most basic thing that you can do given an entire function and you want to bring it down to just one number is to just take its average, right? It's like a crude, uh, you know, representation of the information contained in, in the entire function is just this one number. So for the purpose of this discussion, let's say that you're looking at the average of sine squared nx and cosine squared of nx in from in the interval minus pi by minus pi to plus pi so let me uh, fix the interval to be minus pi to pi pi now and then you will see in a moment we, we can actually shift this 
this period about right we have much more freedom so if i do this so then i will see that uh, in fact i since this quantity is equal to this quantity i can just add the 2 and then divide by 2 so it's half of 1 1 over 2 pi integral minus pi 2 plus pi sin squared of nx plus cosine squared of nx dx therefore but this quantity is nothing but 1 right so therefore i am going to get just a half so the average value of sin squared of nx right is is half right as long as you have taken a, uh, the average over a multiple of the period of this function right okay so let me give you a, a more general argument so if you have a function which has some period p right so the average value of f is the same over any interval of length p right so i have uh, i have looked at you know i have taken it from minus pi to pi to be safe in this argument right but you all you need to do is find the period of this function whichever function it is right if you have an f of x an arbitrary function of by a periodic function with period p so the average value of this function f is the same no matter which interval of length p you consider right so the argument is the following so let us consider the average of this function over a you know period of length p starting at some arbitrary point so i am interested in this integral integral a to a plus p f of x dx and then i have to divide by the length of the interval which is going to be p right so i of a so you would think that this is you know a priori you might uh, expect this to be dependent on a but let's look at what happens if i you know take you know f compute this at some other point a plus delta a right so, so this delta a does not have to be infinitesimal i am not even thinking of that at this point right i am just considering some other point which is at a distance delta a away from a so i of a plus delta a minus i of a is you know i am just in place of a i have to put a plus delta a so i have a plus delta a here i have a plus delta a plus p f of x dx minus this original integral so then i notice that there is this there is this interval which is common to both of these integrals and that is basically it runs from uh, a plus delta a all the way up to a plus p right so there is there is a leftover bit which is from a plus p to a plus p plus delta a so that i have to keep and then i have to also subtract this other part which is also left out which is a to a plus uh, a plus delta a so that part is also left out right so from um, from here you see this and therefore i have you know these two small comp small components or big component doesn't matter it's something that we cannot say because delta a is arbitrary right so i have, but it's precisely this component and this component remains but now we can argue that in fact these two are exactly the same right these two will cancel and you'll get zero and the reason is you can just do a change of variable x can be made to go to x plus p and then you will immediately see that if you invoke the periodicity of this function f of x plus p is equal to f of x therefore both these integrals are the same and the denominator is the p in, is the same p in both therefore the difference of this will be zero therefore we have managed to show that i of a plus delta a is equal to i of a so therefore i of a is actually independent of a you could have started at any point as long as you cover a length p which is the period of of this function you're going to get the same average value right so we will see in our discussion which you know which will uh, work out you know the fourier series representation for this for an arbitrary periodic function in fact the average of this function is is like one of the basic ingredients which goes into this Fourier series and then there are more complicated there are other elements which we will come which will come up right in our discussion but this uh, this lecture is is simply a warm-up exercise once again but you know we are ahead if we have taken one more step towards working out the Fourier series of a periodic function which is coming ahead that's all for this lecture thank you